Please, God, when you give your best attention to building his church, because that's all God is concerned with in this world. It is his only institution in the world. It is God's major project. It is his heart. If you want God to be pleased with you, then you must help him do what he's doing. In John chapter 21, he told Simon Peter, if you love me, then help me do what I'm doing by feeding my sheep. Look at letter B. Growing churches are changing the destiny of souls one at a time. Changing their eternal destiny. Jesus wants people and families to have happy, abundant lives. But folks can only be eternally happy if they're willing to receive the salvation that the Lord offers. The church then is the instrument of God's salvation for mankind. For that reason, the unsaved world urgently needs the existence of a powerful church that is an effective voice against an ungodly, overpowering world system. I want to comment on that, but uh, I'm going to read most of this and I'll come back and make some observations. C. Growth is the natural experience of every healthy church. Note that uh, church growth is natural, but never automatic. As leaders, we will always need to remove the barriers to growth so the life of the Spirit can produce growth in our church. There should always be forward movement and progress in the church. As ministers and leaders, we should always be grateful for what God has given us, but never satisfied where we are. There should always be a passion for more church growth and development. Letter D. Church growth involves vision. We should devise and retain great visions for the church, always striving for greater spiritual and natural impact in the community. We should dream great dreams for the house of God. We should be ambitious and visionary for its prosperity. We must strongly desire, desire to see the church become great and strong. The church should strive for impact through the media, since that's where the devil is fighting so hard on television, on radio, all other effective media outlets. Churches should buy property in the neighborhoods, build shelters, buildings, homes for the community. Churches should own and create businesses that employ individuals and generate economic wealth throughout the community. Above all else, churches should constantly have an increase in congregation size. I've underlined that and I telecised it. Should reach youth, children, and families Constantly seeing new souls coming to faith and becoming established in the kingdom. All right. Every church will always experience some degree of resistance from the enemy. Of course, Satan will seek to resist the church by every means available. Financial attacks are common. At times, the devil will use financial opposition, financial attacks. It is crucial that we recognize how important money is in spiritual matters. Attacks against the morale of the ministry. At other times, the devil will come with decreased morale. Like in the case of the ten doubtful, undermining spies who verbally sabotaged Moses and God's vision for Israel in Numbers chapter 13. It cost two million people their lives. Two million people died in the wilderness because of bad morale. At the time of Israel's rebuilding after captivity, uh, there was in... The days of Ezra and Nehemiah, resistance from Sanballat, Tobiah, and, and, and others through ridicule, through political persecution, and, and there was insubordination from rebellious Israelites such as Cosby and others. And you know those things. We don't have time to read them today. Letter N. What are the persistent enemies of church growth? What stops churches from growing? In our own time, there are a lot of, there are a host of issues that we should be aware of which we should earnestly pray against. These are things that Satan tries to use and promote to stop the kingdom of God from growing. As saints, we must be very alert, careful not to walk, in, uh, careful to walk in strict obedience so the kingdom of God can grow dynamically forward. Now, below are some of the things that cause us to feel convicted when we see these elements in our own personal walk. These are things that hinder any church from going. Number one, selfishness among Christians. Number two, worldliness. Number three is spiritual warfare. The devil and his demons. The gates of hell that we talked about. Number four is when members are not concerned about seeing more souls saved. Number five, a lack of love for God and unconcerned to see God pleased and satisfied. Number six is sin among the members. Disobedient lifestyle. 
Number seven is stinginess when it comes to money. These are the things that stop the church from growing. Number eight, church hopping, incivility, disloyalty. These are key enemies to church progress. Satan likes and promotes and uses church hopping whenever he can to attempt to disrupt and discourage the church. Next thing, spirit of criticism and fault finding, like Miriam and Aaron murmured against Moses over things that were not their business. Next thing, criticism of the leaders, like in Acts chapter 6, when they murmured. Paul in 2 Corinthians, when people tried to steal his members and diminish his influence. Another thing that stops the church from growing is sectarianism. You can call that cliques, divided loyalties. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. Little groups in the church that want to be friends and don't want to be friends with anybody else. Us four and no more. Another thing that stops church growth is the saints gossiping against one another. Busy bodies in the church. Lazy people that won't work. These are things that the enemy tries to use to stop the church from growing. Somebody say amen. 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 It's difficult to even bring up those foregoing issues. But it's useful so that we can repent of any known shortcomings and present ourselves to God in superior service. Now the church and the individual. In one of his books, Pastor Rick Warren begins his great purpose-driven book with the, with the insight. His first line in the book is, it's not about you. Amen, somebody. Amen. Touch somebody, tell them, it's not about you. Amen. You can't live your whole life all focused on yourself. God needs selfless people. He observes that God has given you your gifts and your abilities so you can help him build the church. Do me a favor and underline that. Every resource you've got is for the purpose of you helping God build the church. If you've got money, that's why God gave it to you. If you've got good looks, God gave you good looks so you could lead people to church. If you have a pleasant personality, if you got a good IQ, if you got a big house, God give you a big house so you could use it to do home Bible studies and get people saved. Amen, somebody. Amen. Every resource you have is for the building of God's church. Touch somebody and tell them it's not about you. Tell them I know you're cute, but it's not about you. Y'all scared to say that, huh? They're not going to hit you. Satan constantly and relentlessly seeks to make us think that we're the center of the universe. He seeks to trap saints in selfishness. So they'll treat the church like a second priority concern in your life. In fact, God issues, God's issues ought rightly to come before my issues. As I put God first, God will reward me and will assure that my issues are well taken care of. As saints, we are servants. We are not customers. God is not supposed to build my empire. I am to build God's house and promote his kingdom. We're to serve him. He does not serve us. Amen? Amen. Go to the next page. What is required for God's church to grow? All right. You must have anointed, God-dependent, excellent leadership, both at the pastoral level and at the staff level. For a church to grow, there must be patience. Because there are seasons in the life and development of a church. I wish you had time to talk about it. There must be commitment and perseverance. There must be within the church a spirit of sacrifice. There must be financial support with tithes and offerings. There must be prayer and fasting for the growth of the church. Not generic prayer, but specific prayer that the church will grow. Amen. There must be an evangelistic outreach mindset. There must be unity among the saints. There must be a loving manner of behavior in the way the saints treat one another. The saints must take initiative to see the needs of the house of God and address them. The saints must walk in obedience to the pastor, all church authority. There must be loyalty to the ministry. There must be a spirit of volunteering, not waiting to be drafted to serve the body of Christ. Somebody say amen. 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 There must be a recognition that we are saved to serve. And we must make our gifts and skills available. Let me, let me stop for a moment and break in. Would you get out your pen and write down three T's? Write down T and then next to it another T, then next to it another T. And I'm using that because there's a nice little cliche slogan that talks about that. The first word is time. The second T is talent. The third T is treasures. That's what you must bring to God. You must bring God your time, your talent, 
and your treasure. You must make time in your life to serve God. Yeah. You must use all your abilities to serve God. You must bring your money and your resources to serve God. God gave you your time and your talent and your treasure. And you must bring all that God has given to him, given to you. You must be willing to bring it back to him. Does that make sense to you? Amen. Okay, somebody say my time, my, time. my talent, my and my treasures. Amen. Say all of them belong to God. Now come on, give God a hand raise if you really mean it. Come on, if you really mean to make your time available, to make your talent available. There are people, and I, I know I'm breaking in, I'm trying to get to the end of his reading. There are people that have abilities in our churches, and they won't use them for the glory of God. Amen, that's the truth. There are people that could do things to help go to church, and they won't do it. There are people have, that have money they could give, and they won't make it available. Because they want to, I want to, I want to be, I want to be a, live a, a high lifestyle. I want everybody to see how big my car, I don't care nothing about the needs of the kingdom. I'm going to, I'm going to buy me some new clothes and impress everybody at church. And then I'm going to make them all look at me and, and see how I'm anointed and how blessed I am. So forth. All right. We battle with that. Your time, your talent, and your treasure should be made available. There's nothing that God gave you. That he should not be able to get back from him. Whatever he gave you, you ought to be able to get it back from him. He gives you 24 hours a day. And he deserves to get some of that back in prayer and evangelism. I'm not getting no amens here. He gave you your whole paycheck. You know you got more than enough. I mean, you're living good. And some support beyond your own tithing and giving. Sometimes the tithes and offering are not going to meet the need. You've got to do some other things. You must seek first the kingdom. This is what it takes to have a growing church. Placing God's issues and God's concerns first. Knowing that as you bless God, he'll bless you. You must make God's agenda primary over your own personal agenda. God always will make time for your family needs and issues. God is not crazy. He's not irrational. Direction through prayer and pastoral counsel will always produce a well-balanced ministry. You must realize that you're a servant of Jesus Christ. You are not a customer. You don't come to church to be served. You come to serve. Amen? Amen. You must be free from selfishness, from self-will, and self-promotion. When those things exist, the church can grow. All right, I've got seven minutes. Look at the down below. There's some general principles about church growth. The planting of the seed produces growth. But there's always an estimate, an element rather, a mystery in the process. So look at that for a moment. Go to Mark chapter 4, verse 28. I know I'm slowing down, but I promise you I'll stop one time. I observe time very carefully. I think everything should start on time and everything should stop on time. Amen? Amen. Anything else is just disorder. Amen? Amen? God is not the author of confusion. Amen? Amen? All right, so we have to be orderly. Look at verse number 26, Mark 4, 26. And this will probably consume most of the rest of my time. The Lord Jesus talked to him. He said, the kingdom of heaven is as if a man should cast seed into the ground. And then he should sleep and rise night and day. And the seed then will spring up and grow up. He knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, then immediately he put it in the sickle. Because the harvest has now arrived. All right. So what I'm showing you, what the Lord is showing you. I'm not sure the Lord is showing you in this is that the work of God has an element of mystery. I want you to look at verse 27. He says the key to the work of God is the seed. How many know the seed is a word? Amen. Amen. All right, verse number six. So the key, 26, the key to church growth is putting good word out there. Preach good. Mm -hmm. Teach good. Mm -hmm. Take the word all over the East Valley. Amen. Put the Amen. word in your mouth. Put the word before the people of God. Put it in the ground, which is the heart, the soil. And then verse number 27. Then he says, what does a farmer do? The farmer didn't sit up all night trying to help make the seed grow. Oh man, I hope that corn I planted is doing something out here. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine my brother tells the story? When he was a little boy in school, they were trying to teach him about agriculture and they had him planting seeds. And he said, his seed never grew because every day he'd go in and dig it up to see how it was doing. <laughs> how dumb is that? See, some things God has to do, amen? 
See, we can come and have a seminar on church growth, what makes a church grow, what stops a church from growing, what should we be doing, how should we think. When we get through with all of that, ultimately, the growth of the church has elements of mystery. And somebody give God a hand praise for God who's in control, for God who knows what he's doing. And that's what Jesus is saying in that 27th verse. So he said, so just put the seed out there, do what you should do, touch your neighbor, tell them after you've done your part, <laughs> tell them again, after you've done your part, Go get some sleep. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen for that. Amen for that. You can only do what you can do. All God expects you to do is be obedient to what He told you to do. The earth, look at that in verse 28. The earth brings forth of herself. There's a dynamic there that you're not in control of. What was your part? Your part was to plow up the soil, put the seed in. Put some water on it. Come back and fertilize it every now and then. And touch it and tell them, let God do the rest of it. So in all that we've said today, we've just scratched the surface. There are things we didn't get to. There's a couple pages and a half that we didn't get to. But in all that we've said today, when it's all said and done, we're not in control. Bishop Newman is not in control of what God's going to do. Pastor Locke, Pastor Hudson, Pastor Brown, Pastor Ross. Nobody's in control of what God's going to do. What God is doing is giving us a clear, unmistakable understanding of our part. Lord, what do you want, Pastor Hudson's on his face, Lord, what do you want Shield of Faith Christian Center in Mesa to do? What doors do we knock on? When do we put on the community uh, baby shower? When, when, do we, when, when do we go on campus? What is it? What are the strategies and activities that you're calling. When do we have a prayer meeting about church growth? How much are we to fast? How do we design, you know, just tell us what to do. And then all we can do is be obedient to what God is saying. And after we do what God said, there's an element of the supernatural that we can't control. All we can do is knock on doors and bring them in here. When we get them in here, we can't make them repent, we can't remit their sins, and we sure can't give them the Holy Ghost. Right. But if we do, come on somebody, give God a hand. Yes. If we do what God told us to do. Yes. So, our ear is to God's mouth. 